This is Bloomberg Intelligence. We're really getting into now the streaming arms race. Dish is looking at that and saying we can really build a nice niche for ourselves. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The dollar is the dominant concept in the planet. I think the acquisition is a natural progression of what Microsoft can do with this technology going forward. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Over the next hour, we will dig inside the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global markets. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. Today, we look at government policy and its impact on everything from big pharma to gas and renewables, plus how European retail sales staples are faring amid sharp cost hikes and food price inflation. But first, assets in ESG ETFs, they shrank 14% in the first half of this year and a Slow down, slow down could be prolonged if performance continues to be challenged. For more on this, we welcome Bloomberg Intelligence ESG strategist Shaheen Contractor. Shaheen, is the glow off of this ESG strategy, movement, investment philosophy, is that is the glow kind of off it? Well, not so much. It's... I agree. It's been a tough year for ESG. I think, you know, when we say assets have declined 14%, a large part of that was this unraveling of concentration risk. And what that means is assets have grown by these, you know, large one-off allocations, and that's starting to come out. So what this really means is cyclicality and flows going forward. And yes, if we don't have a wider investor base, we are going to see challenges. All right. So very tough start to the year for all equities for fixed income that 60 40 portfolio did not work are are we getting a sense here that when times get tough people maybe go back to what they know and maybe not you know something that's kind of quote unquote new in their portfolio which would be esg so you know the only other time period we've seen sort of with ESG was COVID, right? And yep. I would argue that COVID saw no decline in ESG. In fact, it took off. Okay. So I think this year is more to do with performance. You know, the overweight tech, the underweight energy, people didn't like that. And I think that's a large re- reason why with this year was a little different. So when I look at an ESG ETF, I feel like I'm looking at a concentrated tech fund or a concentrated healthcare fund. I'm like, <laughs> where's the magic? Where's the secret sauce here? Is there a concern within the ESG community that, it's maybe not well enough to find or broadly enough to find to have some, some more representation? I think, though, yes, you're right. It's it's not diversified enough. I view ESG as, you know, the best ESG-friendly stocks within a certain industry. It doesn't necessarily need to have this industry skew, if that makes sense. So yep. whether, you know, given the fact that a lot of these funds are overweight tech, underweight energy, I would call that a diversification problem yes and how about like when i first started hearing about esg call it 12 13 years ago it came from really my institutional investor clients in europe Mm -hmm. um leading the way it it, is it more of a popular strategy in europe than it is in the u.s or is it things evening out things have evened out over time europe still is you know the majority the u.s has been playing catch up though i have to say this last this This year, specifically, the U.S. has really dropped down much more than Europe. We'll see how that plays bigger picture. But over a longer term, U.S. is catching up. Okay, talk to us about data. Um, You know, at the FA function on the Bloomberg Terminal, Mm -hmm. has lots of great ESG data. There's actually a tab there for ESG data. But I've heard from market participants that, you know, when I do my financial analysis, I've got income statements, balance sheets, cash flow statements. But when I go to ESG, I don't, and I don't know those are audited, and I kind of know the source, and I compare company A to company B to company C. ESG, the quality and the quantity of data isn't out there. Is it getting better? It is getting better over time. I think, you know, there are many frameworks that are evolving and continue to evolve. There are many sort of industry organizations that continue to recommend metrics and, and sort of reporting has increased. It is a challenge. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it will continue to be. Continue Continue to be, but I think that's you know the the trend that any new disclosure in industry faces. It takes it'll take a while. To Who's sort of, leading the way in that? Is that a, a, some of the European regulators, or is it the SEC here in the states? In terms of dis, in terms of mandating disclosure, yeah, yeah, it's the European. The SEC definitely has this new set of rules that that will play a large part of the role, but it's been traditionally Europe. If I'm just a generic portfolio manager in Boston. And I'm a, you know, a growth at a reasonable price or whatever. I'm a value type investor. Is ESG part of my analysis or is it really reserved for people that are just kind of ESG focused? 
It really depends on what the strategy is and what what you believe. If you believe that ESG over the long term will, you know, have some kind of advantage, then that's an overlay. Um, it it really depends on what 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 you seek to achieve. All right. So talk to us about the inflows, outflows, the trends over the last several years, and maybe what you're expecting. Going sure. forward. So for ESG ETFs, uh, I mean, definitely over the last few years, we've seen these flows skyrocket, right? Right. We've seen it go 5x, 7x, and we saw a bit of a slowdown this year. Uh, if you ask me going forward, I think it's going to be defined by cyclicality. And what I mean by that is, you know, when one institution says, oh, I want to allocate 2 billion flows, are going to go up, mm-hmm. people are going to cheer. But the next year, that 2 billion might come out and people are going to cry. And that's exactly what we saw this year. It's all those, you know, if you look at a flow chart, it's a peak and a trough. And it's that one, you know, one number rather than like a scribbly line that tells yep. you there are many investors going in. Well, at, at Bloomberg Intelligence, speaking of the cyclicality, at Bloomberg Intelligence, we have near nearly 400 analysts around the world uh, covering 2,000 companies, 130 industries. How many people do we have allocated to kind of ESG investing? For Bloomberg Intelligence? Yes. Um, I feel like our team is right now... Upward of 15 people. All right. So the future going forward for flows, um, the expectation is still cyclicality. 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 One year up when institutions decide to allocate and one year down when nobody allocates. All right. That's good stuff. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence ESG strategist Shaheen Contractor coming up on the program. How the UK's $1.6 trillion mortgage market remains key to domestic banks' growth and profitability. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 13 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, commentary from major UK lenders, along with Barclays' $2.79 billion purchase of Kensington Mortgages, confirmed the importance of the UK's mortgage market to domestic bank growth. For more on this, let's bring in Bloomberg Senior Bank's analyst, Jonathan Tice. Jonathan, talk to us about the mortgage market in the UK these days. You know, over the last, maybe the last two and a half, three years, a lot of market dislocations. But just give us an overview of kind of how that market's been performing. Sure. I mean, if you think about banks uh, globally, but particularly in the UK and Europe, there has been no growth apart from uh, mortgages for many years now. And uh, the market over here, home ownership is a big thing in Britain, much bigger than it is in the continent. And it's been pretty much the only game in town for the banks. So it was very competitive. Uh, then COVID hit um, and then a lot of offers were withdrawn. Then the market got very competitive again. Um, and now um, some of the research we published recently uh, what was probably a sort of 1% mortgage offer about 9, 12 months ago has more than tripled now. Yep. So the market is getting very attractive for the banks. Um, house prices have gone through the roof. How is the housing market now? Because we've had here also a red hot housing market in the US, but it signs that it's cooling off as, as rates uh, moved up earlier. I mean, the, the last month, the year, and the year figure was 10% um, growth. I think the point over here is that there's very little supply. Right. So uh, our prices are fifty inflated, almost certainly. But that said, do we think that there's going to be an imminent crash? Probably not because of a lack of supply. But the fact is, um, the rate of growth is going to dramatically slow. And uh, um, my best guess would be next year you're talking down mid-single digits probably from pretty pretty elevated levels. How about the regionality? Here in the States, John, you know, during the pandemic, we've had some real regional strength in certain parts of the country, people kind of leaving the coast, maybe going to lower cost cities around the country. Are you seeing regional differences in just the housing market in the UK? What's been interesting, obviously, COVID, uh, London suddenly was less attractive. Right. So house prices in London for quite a while have lagged and they'd already, um, there was sort of 12 times um, salary, which is multiples <laughs> more than when I first bought 25 years ago. But yeah, the North, Wales, those sort of areas have been playing catch up very much. And also there's been a dislocation because we've had an issue after a very, very nasty, fatal apartment block fire a few years ago that yeah. we have a cladding issue in the UK, which means that a lot of apartments, that there aren't enough flats for sale. And if you've got one and you've got a cladding issue, you can't sell it. So there's also been houses versus flats 
a very big dislocation as well. But by and large, London and the South East has now lagged, having outperformed for years and years. Yeah, it's interesting. I was actually riding in on the Heathrow Express that day when that fire was there. Really, very tough news there. So thinking about mortgage rates here, is yet our Federal Reserve is cranking up rates. The Bank of England is pushing rates up higher. Is there a sense that that's really going to put a damper on the UK housing market? Well, um, another interesting thing is that we had a stress test over here. So when a bank would lend you money, they'd have to assume, okay, so if interest rates are three percentage points higher, can you still afford it? And now exactly the time when you would think if ever there was an appropriate time to have that, they have abolished it as of August 1st. So I think from my perspective, because house prices have gone up so much, loan to values for the banks have been made very comfortable. Remortgaging will still be pretty attractive. I mean, we have about 25 billion a month of mortgage approvals here, a little bit higher at the moment. So it'll slow down, yes. As I say, because of some strange quirk and the, the timing, the way it's come through, I do think, and also because it's secured, that the banks are still very keen, particularly the bigger banks, to lend because, yes, you've got net interest income going up because interest rates are going up, but bear in mind that mortgages are secured particularly if you're remortgaging something that's on 50, 40, 30% loan to value and something like a third of the housing stock, if not more in the UK, has no mortgage. If ever people are going to take money out of their house to give their children, their grandchildren, help them get on the ladder, etc., etc., for a number of reasons, I think mortgage volumes are not going to fall off a cliff. But certainly house prices really have only one way to go from here. But I, I don't think it's kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater either. Right. What are the banks, what are some of the names that we should be thinking about uh, as we think about the UK uh, housing market? Well, I mean, Lloyd's is, is the number one player. They've got about 20% market share. But actually, HSBC, um, they, they've been pretty aggressive because we changed the way that banks kind of um, were capitalized and structured after 2008. So we now have ring fence banks. So um, HSBC has got an awful lot of deposits in the UK and it's retail ring fence bank that it can't do anything with. So it's very keen, for example, if you can charge 3.5% to lend down a secured mortgage. So Barclays, NatWest, HSBC. Interestingly, Santander, which was very active in the UK market and it's now about a third of its balance sheet, wow. I think they're probably beginning to think, actually, we don't want to be quite as competitive as the market is. So Barclays, NatWest, um, those guys are being pretty aggressive. Yeah, interesting. Banco Santander. So, you know, one of the questions a lot of folks have is just, uh, you know, um, is it time to buy? I mean, what are the brokers saying over the mortgage brokers? Are they saying, you know, prices are still too high, but, you know, the interest rates are pretty good? I mean, what's the typical housing pitch, do you think, these days in the UK? Well, well I mean, what happened when, when COVID hit, all offers for first-time buyers, so 90 and 95% land value, they disappeared. Okay. So the government had to step in and they put in a government guarantee scheme for 95% land value. So bizarrely, I've got plenty of equity in my house, for example. The rate that I will get to refinance is not that much lower than a 95% loan-to-value loan from my bank right now. Right. So, for example, they still want first-time buyers because they can point to the government, etc., and say, look, we are being good banks. Also, you've got the government guarantee, which is due to run out at the end of this year, but I suspect they may extend that. House prices, well, yeah, I mean, they are. When you look at the affordability metrics, they are towards the top end of what they've been for the last five to ten years and, and over a 30-year period they're way high but equally it's the cost of rent yep. i mean yes mortgages are still going up but renting has been that much more expensive for, for a great deal of time and as i say for british people certainly baby boomers etc home ownership was the way they got wealthy and home ownership is the way that we think about it i think millennials probably a little bit more experience over ownership now so not quite as big a drive how about just generally speaking, uh, Jonathan, Bloomberg's headquarters in London, right in the center of the city of London, beautiful new, brand new building, so much new building construction of office space. Every time I go to London, I'm just amazed how many cranes there are in the city. Are people coming back to London or are they staying away? Well, I think the, um, the, the sort of working from the office two to three days a week is picking up. And, and if you pick the right day, you come back to the city, you would think it was 2018, 2019. Mm. And, I, and also, I, I think people, we saw the big migration. Everybody wanted to live in Cornwall or a, a two-hour <laughs> commute away from London. We are seeing people have also realized it's not all it's cracked up to be. You don't have the, the, the convenience that you have in London. So... I think that trend is slowly reversing. But I mean, that said, London house prices were already so expensive that, as I say, if you're a first-time buyer, it's an awful lot of money for a one-bed flat, right. sort of two, two and a half times the national average for a three-bed house. 
Wow. It just it sounds like a crazy imbalance there. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Banks Analyst Jonathan Tice. Coming up in the program, we get the mid-year outlook for European retail staples. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies in 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 25 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, we'll be here each and every week at this time tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts covering some 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. A sharp hike in cost and food price inflation has seen food retailers' prospects diverging. And major European competitors like Carrefour and Tesco, they're facing challenges with discount competitors. From where we're pleased to welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Charles Allen. Charles, give us a sense here. Inflation's everywhere. It's, you know, it's it's a global phenomenon for the most part. It's at the gas pump, but it's really at the supermarket as well. Talk to us about how that is in the UK and Europe. I think what we're seeing, though, is that consumers are behaving in a different way. First of all, they're going, as you alluded to, to shop at discount stores where things are cheaper. Also, the stores have a smaller selection, so you're not tempted to buy so much. So for the large supermarkets who historically had liked inflation because it te- they tended to increase margins at those moments, are now under somewhat pressure. And I think this is really about the maturity of the market. When we look back into the 1980s and 1990s when Carrefour and Tesco and our whole were all doing really well when inflation was mid to upper single digits, they were actually the low cost operators Mm. and they were gaining market share. You know, when I read your research, Charles, and I've talked over the years, I come to understand how thin the margins are for most uh, supermarket chains. So I, as I think about some of these price increases for food items and consumer goods, I wonder to what degree these supermarkets are in fact passing along price increases as opposed to taking in, in their margin, which is already pretty thin. Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, they have to pass the prices along. They just can't, as you say, the margins are so thin, they just can't afford not to. I mean, I think it's all around the margin and, sorry, in a different sense, it's just there's a slightly different aspect to this in the the sense is that they're probably selling a bit less. People are cutting back on the amount of items they buy. And so within the supermarket itself is you've just got pressure on your total amount of volume going through the store. And at the same time, your costs are going up because you've obviously got all the energy costs, all the fuel costs, the wage costs that are increasing. And so this is what's probably putting the pressure on the profit margin that we're seeing is that the top line is having to increase with the price rises, but the costs are going up as fast, if not a bit faster. Are there or is there a material difference between the environment in the UK versus the continent? Well, I think the UK is probably a little bit worse at the moment in the sense that the wage squeeze seems more acute and almost certainly Brexit has added sort of 2% to the inflation rate is just... Oh, that's right. I <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> because it's just more difficult to trade with Europe now. And realistically, Britain imports about half the food. So it's coming from elsewhere. So there are definitely extra factors there. You know, France has been pretty good about making sure that consumers are protected from some of the price rises, particularly on utilities, which is probably making it a bit easier for consumers there. But I mean, in almost every country, you know, Germany, the Netherlands and everything, we're seeing the same sort of trends. And it's just difficult for retailers. How the shares performed, obviously, the equities across the board have been under pressure all year, but just wondering how can the supermarket chains have fared recently? Well, I think what we've seen is that, you know, with the exception of a few of the discounters and to a degree Carrefour, which is a bit of a one-off, is actually they've sort of come down with the market and in some cases have underperformed the market. And I think this is what's different from what we had seen in previous inflation periods when you expected the supermarkets to outperform because you saw them, their profits and everything as a safe haven when inflation was picking up. But people, I think correctly, are much more cautious about the prospects at the moment. And the war in Ukraine, it's obviously, it's, I think it's such a, probably a bigger issue for Europe, obviously, and European companies. And I wonder if that's impacting just the, the food chain, the supermarket, the retail side of it as well. Do you see it? Well, I mean, actually, 
there are a couple of sort of what we may say slightly unusual things. I mean, one is there's obviously the impact on the soft commodity prices yeah. that are actually people are seeing globally, and that's going to roll over into next year because obviously you don't put wheat or sunflower oil directly into a foodstuff. It needs to be processed and goes through. Is actually what we are seeing and. You know, I don't know how long this will go on, is actually the companies that are in Poland have actually had a bit of a boost because the very large refugee population, uh-huh. and, you know, it's been as high as a million people, which right. is, you know, it adds 2.5% to the Polish population. They have to eat as well. And so yeah. we've, you know, there's been a little bit of a, I mean, They've just done a little bit better yep. in terms of sales in Poland as that. But I mean, I don't think anyone thinks this is a good thing. And I'm sure that, you know, all the retailers who operate in Poland would prefer that they sure. weren't seeing that boost. But it's there. It's there. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Charles Allen. We appreciate that. Coming up on the program, U.S. lawmakers are working on a $370 billion reconciliation bill with a focus on climate and energy. And we look into some of the key takeaways for the oil and gas sector. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 39 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, well, U.S. lawmakers' $370 billion climate and energy reconciliation proposal includes three key takeaways that would be most impactful for the oil and gas sector. Let's drill down on that with Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Brandon Barnes. All right, Brandon, what are those key issues for the energy space? Hey, Paul, I like the use of drill down there. That's yep. good. Um, and uh, let's start with drilling, right? So EMPs are probably the most impacted in terms of costs being added to them from the proposed reconciliation bill. It is coming in two different ways. One is a methane fee, which is a very popular approach from Democrats and those opposed to fossil fuels these days, is try and tag a fee on for emissions of methane at various places, wellhead, compressors, pipelines, where have you. The other one is going to be they're going to raise royalty rates on federal lands. The 4% raise, these are billions of dollars across the industry, but that's helpful when you actually have land to drill on from the federal government, which is what brings us to the second <laughs> takeaway, which is there's a net positive for offshore. So offshore drilling in the U.S., as we all know, Gulf of Mexico is primary target for exploration and production. There has not been a viable acreage sale from the federal government since before the fall of 2021. And so that has, you know, and we wouldn't, we weren't supposed to see one until at least fourth quarter of 23. So this bill addresses all of that and everything in between, and even going back further by reinstating old lease sales that were invalidated by a court. Let me give you a couple couple people on, uh, who are important in that place. You've got Chevron, Oxy, BP, Shell, Exxon. All of them were the high, those are the highest bidders from that sale that would be reinstated, $192 million in bids. That's just one sale. Those are supposed to happen at least once a quarter, and we haven't had one. Right. So this bill would put that back into place. Third thing we wanted to talk about was actually outside of this, the whatever backroom dealings were going on between Senators Schumer and Manchin was allegedly, part of that was, we're going to agree later on to change federal permitting altogether sometime in the fall, maybe end of September. Big changes to energy infrastructure permitting, which hits renewables and oil and gas infrastructure in the same way, because no one's getting anything built based on permitting, challenges in the courts, et cetera. Interestingly enough, there's a carve out for Mountain Valley Pipeline, Equitrans Midstream. That is the big one we think Senator Manchin has been using to try and he wants to get that pushed through. That goes West Virginia to Virginia. Big gas pipe. Sure. Been stuck for a long time. Brandon, just give us a sense here. I mean, you know, we were just paying $5 a gallon for gasoline a few weeks ago. There's real energy shortage that's going to get very acute in Europe this winter. What's the feeling within the energy space, within the regulatory aspect of the energy space about, okay, we need to move towards clean energy, but boy, we also need some of this fossil fuel stuff to tide us over. There's a lot of energy insecurity out there. How do you think about that? Well, look, I think I think that's we talked about this before and, and with reference to midstream, especially LNG exporters, right? U.S. keeps getting hit in different ways. LNG, Freeport went offline because they had a fire and they're trying to get back up. They've just recently got, come to agreement with FIMSA, the, the federal uh, regulator there. You got Sabine Pass and Schneer. They're trying to push back on a, an air rule. Like there's all this regulatory morass that is 
threatening transmission and export of energy that could really help Europe, especially on the natural gas side. So I think there are certainly positive signals coming out of the companies in the energy and gas, oil and gas companies here that are saying, you know, we wouldn't mind having this bill out there because that would help with especially federal acreage for offshore. But maybe we get some permitting deal that we we really badly need. Yeah, because it's it's interesting. Again, I think most people generally support the move towards green energy. But boy, I just had you know WTI crude at one hundred and twenty dollars a barrel. You know, a few months ago, it's since come down. And but it just seems like. And I keep asking people, well, just go build a new refinery. You know, and they tell me that's not so easy. Number one and number two, there's really no incentive to go do that because again, they're getting a lot of pressure from a lot of areas to move towards green energy. It seems like it's a very difficult transition. Yeah, really mixed signals coming out of Washington, D.C., right? You know, they're being big oil companies being called greedy. They're saying that, you know, gas prices are here because you guys are trying to get bigger profits. But it just the way energy works, you know, worldwide, it's all connected. That doesn't really ring true. Yep. And what's being offered from certain corners of policymakers is let's push hard for green, sure. But there's no bridge. There's no bridge from where we are now, the way we consume electricity, the way we use it for transportation, and where people want us to go. And that that reality just hasn't been crossed. I think that's the mix we get between politics in D.C. and sort of the reality of electricity and energy consumption in the United States. Right. I mean, now $370 billion, this climate and energy reconciliation proposal seems like a big number to me. Is it? Is it? Give us a sense of how material it is. Um, will it move the needle? Probably. I mean, honestly, this is more of a political move than anything else. Okay. This is, let's let's get a win. We need something. We couldn't get Build Back Better. This is a very light version of Build Back Better. You know, the last bill they got through that Infrastructure Act, that was over a trillion. And yep. so this is much smaller in terms of the bigger packages that they would try and get through. You know, overall, it's it's in the $700 million range, but there's some that the energy and climate portion of $370 billion. You know, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. Those are big numbers, but for government spending, it's not a ton. And it's likely that, you know, what this is going to do for the most part is, is this is targeting the tax side, right? Let's get some incentives out there to continue building those renewable projects. Let's get some incentives out there on EVs. Let's try and push people to come back to the table and develop again. All right. Great stuff there, Brandon. Really appreciate it. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Brandon Barnes. All right. While we're talking about bills, another major piece of legislation in the works is the $740 billion Inflation Reduction Act. The renewable industry may benefit if it passes, while others, like Big Pharma, might not be so lucky. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Government Analyst Dwayne Wright. Dwayne, what's in this bill for the healthcare industry? Uh, uh, good to join you. Uh, there's a couple of pieces. And if we start with the, the pharmaceutical side of things, uh, the bill includes the Democrats' longstanding goal to rein in drug prices. Uh, there's a provision in the bill that would allow or require the Secretary of HHS to negotiate prices on some high expenditure Part D and Part D drugs. And those prices would be available in the Medicare marketplace. Now, the bill is, and what's been proposed, is short of what Democrats had proposed in the past, but there are enough moderate Democrats in in the House and in the Senate to scale back the proposal so that we're looking at, at least for the first couple of years, only a handful of products, 10 to 15 products that will be subject to negotiation. And again, those prices would be passed on to Medicare. The savings are not as big as what Democrats had hoped they'd see in previous proposals, but they are significant. It'll bring in about $100 billion in savings over the next 10 years, which will be used to either reduce the deficit or to uh, pay for other items that are included in the bill. So, Dwayne, I think what you know most families, maybe the only thing they can agree upon around the you know, Thanksgiving table is that drug prices are too high. Is there a plan? Is there a path from a legislative perspective to get drug prices down? Well, Democrats would say this is the path because okay. uh, what, what, what the bill would do is essentially say, look, we have these high cost drugs that are on the marketplace. And in particular, we have these, these therapies that have been on the marketplace for a while. They don't have generic competition. And that's part of the reason why these costs are so high. So by allowing the Secretary of HHS, Medicare, to lower the prices, to negotiate lower prices, 
that should, in theory, be bleed into what the average consumer would pay uh, for these drugs. So the democratic answer to that would be yes. Uh, yeah. you know, it's that's a problem, and this is how we're going to solve the problem. Is are there certain companies, certain sectors within the healthcare space that are maybe net winners versus net losers? Well, so if we look at the pharmaceutical space first, uh, a lot of the initial losers will be some of the, the names we are very familiar with. So uh, we modeled out a, a scenario where uh, about 10 drugs would be the first to get negotiated in 2026 and have their prices cut. So looking at Pfizer uh, and their uh, breast cancer drug eye branch, uh, could see a 50% cut in prices. Zorelto from J&J, a blood thinner, could see 65%. And in Simicort from AstraZeneca, uh, for asthma and CUPD, they could see a 60% cut. So the, the brand name manufacturers could see a cut uh, in 2026. But if we're looking globally at the healthcare sector, it's important to keep in mind that it there's a side of this where managed care companies come into play. And this is a, it's a separate provision um, that Democrats included in this package, which is to extend enhanced ACA Affordable Care Act subsidies for those enrolled in the ACA. Uh, those subsidies were included in the American Rescue Package Act from 2021, but they expire at the end of 2022. And as it stands, those companies uh, that are on the ACA marketplace, they're about to send out premium notices right. to individuals, and that's going to be in October. And they've warned, and we've seen some studies, that the estimates for premiums for next year could be 50% higher, leading oh, to boy. 3 million people losing coverage or dropping coverage because yep, yep. it's, it's no longer affordable. So you have companies like Centene, who will benefit uh, because they have roughly 14% of the market share on the ACA market. Right. And you have other companies like uh, Elevance and Molina and Oscar who will, who will stand to benefit as well. All right. A lot of big numbers out there. A lot of moving pieces in healthcare as there typically is. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Government Analyst Dwayne Wright. That's this week's edition of Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 57 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.